you for being here and for returning um, fans or champions that we have. Uh, tonight is our fourth installment for the Fall Faculty Series um, that has been covering uh, reflections on different aspects of 9-11 um, during the 20th anniversary of 9-11. So after the presentation, there'll be a few minutes for discussion or questions. If you're live streaming on YouTube, you can type comments or questions in and they will be relayed to us here. Um, there's some cookies over there, so please help yourself. Um, let me introduce our presenter, Dr. Dennis Dew. Um, he got his PhD in social psychology at Loyola University uh, Chicago in 2006. He's been teaching psychology for 15 years. Yes, all of them at Mount Mercy. Um, the best ones, no doubt. Before becoming an academic, Dennis worked in a research company based out of University of Chicago, and five years ago he was doing, or he did um, in 2016, a Paul Faculty presentation on fear, um, what was it, fear of an immigrant nation. So he is back to talk to us more about fairy people. So please help me welcome uh, Dr. Dennis Dew. Thanks, Joe. Thanks, Joe. I'm going to take this off. I am uh, triple immunized, and I have my flu shot as well, so I am, I am no biological threat to you. Uh, yeah, so uh, I see some folks here who probably are old enough to remember 9-11, so we're going to talk a little bit about that today. Um, yeah, like Joe said, I'm a, I'm a psychology professor here. I'm a social psychologist. If you don't know what a social psychologist is, we study, I like to think of it as everyday psychology. It's sort of like the psychology of how people interact with each other, not in any kind of abnormal or uh, uh, you, uh, you know, any other kind of, any kind of way that might be, need therapy, right? So I'm not a therapist, it's not, that's not my thing. Um, and these are my thoughts about, as a social psychologist, um, you know, drawing on some of the theory that I teach and that I know about and that I use in research, my thoughts on 9-11. Uh, on and yeah, here I am back again talking about fear. Uh, that's interesting, because that's not something that I think of as my big, area of research, but it seems to be pretty relevant these days, I think, as a, as a social psychologist. Okay, so um, before we really dig into things, I want to go through a little timeline of the morning of 9-11, just to kind of remind you guys of, you know, sort of what happened. I know not everybody was, was glued to the television or the, uh, or the internet at that time, so, uh, so let's go over this here. So a little short uh, timeline of events. At 8.46 a.m., that's Eastern Time, uh, the first plane hits the World Trade Center north. And so it's this one here, right? It's, it hits up a little bit higher, right? That's 8.46. Uh, at 9.03, so we're talking, you know, a little over 15 minutes later, the second plane hits uh, the second tower. And it hits it quite a bit faster. It hits it about 100 miles an hour faster than the first plane hit. And it hits it a little bit lower, right? We can see it here. Um, okay. At 9.40, so roughly 40 minutes later, a little over half an hour, plane three hits the Pentagon. So this all happened really quickly. Uh, and then um, just before 10 a.m., so just a, a little, little, before, little, more, little less than an hour before the South Tower uh, collapses after it was hit, a little, after, a little, little less than an hour. So the second tower collapsed first. It was the first, second one hit, but it collapsed first. Um, now, they said it's probably because the plane was coming in a lot faster speed and was able to shear through uh, some more of the uh, sort of the metal skeleton that's in the, on the outside of the, um, outside of the, the World Trade Center. At 10.10 a.m., the United Flight 93 cra crashes in Shanksville, Pennsylvania. That's the one that we think that the, the passengers uh, took over from the, uh, from the terrorists and uh, intentionally crashed the plane. We can't, never, can't ever know that but that's sort of the leading theory there. Um, and then at, at 10.30 a.m., the North Tower collapses. So this all happened in a really short period of time on a Tuesday morning, uh, pretty nice, clear, nice weather, uh, September afternoon, or September morning in, uh, in New York City. Total of just under 3,000 people, 2,996 people died uh, that morning, uh, including the 19 terrorist hijackers. Okay, so that's sort of our, our baseline there for what happened on that day. So I'm going to guess that those of you who are around uh, are maybe attempting to remember and telling, thinking, thinking to yourself about what 
you were going through, how you found all this out. So what, uh, how did you first learn about it? I want you to ask yourself these questions, then we'll give you a little opportunity, you can, we can talk about it. Okay, so how did you first learn about it? Where were you at? Okay. What were you doing at the time? All right, this is m morning time on the East Coast. How did you feel when you first heard of the, became aware of the attack? What were those emotions right there? Okay. Who's the first person you communicated uh, ab with about that attack? Okay. And then maybe you can remember this one. What were you doing immediately before you became aware of the attack? Okay. Does anybody care to share what, uh, what they were thinking, what was going on, where they were at when all this happened? I know, growing up, Joe? Sure, I'll share. I was in grad school at Indiana University. So when I first learned about it, I actually was heading to class and the TV was on. And as I was walking by, everybody was staring around the TV, and I was like, what's going on? And that was when the first planet hit. And it's interesting just because we still held class. And um, the professor gave us a little break sometime in between, and that's when the buildings had collapsed. And then we stopped learning, but he was like, you know what? Let's just talk. Let's just talk about this incident, you know? And so it was, it was a rather interesting moment from that perspective, just because you know, it, it was tough to register what was going on and what was happening um, in that setting. And uh, actually, funny enough, I think it was a sociology class that I was going to. Oh, really? Okay. So it was a sociologist, you know, a sociology professor that was really kind of running that conversation. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, it was, you know, the first person I communicated with was my fiance at the time, who was my wife, and so she, you know, we, we both went to Indiana at the same time, and she was in optometry school. So it was just one of those things that, you know, we were able to, once, once I got some free time outside of the class to, to converse, and then, yeah, I mean, it was, the rest of that day, I'm not sure I remember it, except for just kind of following the news and just okay. kind of seeing what happened. Interesting, interesting, okay. Anybody else? What happened to you? What's your memory of that morning? Yes, sir. So I remember I lived in Denver, Colorado at the time, so it was earlier there. I got off for an early morning bike ride, came back into in our bedroom. My wife was still in there. She had the TV on. I come in from my bike ride. I'm sort of real happy and energized, and I see, not live, but I saw an image of the plane hitting the tower. I looked at it for half a second. I turned to my wife, and I said, that seems like a pretty tasteless idea for a disaster movie. So I, when I first saw it, I thought this was a preview of some upcoming disaster movie. And she just looked at me and shook her head. Wow. And then I turned back around and really registered what was, what was happening. Dead. Wow. OK, interesting. Great. Anybody else? Yes, Joe. I, I was um, at, at the, the a Goodyear tire shop in Cedar Rapids getting new, new tires on a van at the time. I remember that being a very odd semester for me, honestly, because I had changed from being a journalist to professor. So it was in the first few weeks of that transition. And, and so I, I felt, I don't know, kind of up in the air anyway. I was in a new town. I had never lived in the city of Largest Cedar Rapids before. And um, I just remember that how weird it was at that tire shop because it was a, usually a pretty busy place. And there, you know, no, nobody who didn't have to be there was there that day. And the guys that were working on my van, it's like usually one person would, you know, give you the two new tires. I think probably a dozen of them worked on the van because they kept taking shifts. They like rotated quickly. One would go work for two minutes, and everybody else was in the customer lounge with me, watching TV. Um, and and I, I was also, I don't remember everything about that day clearly, but I know today when something big happens, your cell phone was, you know, and that was before. Mm -hmm. that I didn't have a cell phone back when this happened, and, and I don't remember, typically I would listen to or watch some news in the morning, and I don't remember if I knew before I went to the tire shop that this was happening or not, uh, but it might have been that that was the first thing I did that morning, because I know I talked that afternoon. So okay. that, 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 just, that weird environment, just that weird feeling of, of that sense of unreality, that trying to process what is this and what's going on, and, and everybody that day was like, you know, is this the beginning of something? Is this the start of an attack? It's just like, you know, Pearl Harbor and I'll be suddenly at war. And um, you can see 
of rapids. There were all kinds of rumors. They shut down Mundale Mall that day. Um, you know, probably the tire shop closed. And there was worries, you know, because of Rockwell Column, which was that, you know, if they're going to be some water attacks. And then just that day and the next day, how weird it was that there weren't any airplane slots that, that, that travel just completely shut down. Yeah. It's interesting you mentioned about the Lindale Mall and Rockwell Collins. My experience in talking to people about this, uh, their, their memories with this, um, it seems like everybody, no matter, no matter where they lived, there was something nearby that they thought could be a target from the terrorists, right? I was in downtown Chicago. I was working in a skyscraper. I guess you could call it that. It's a 48-story building, not quite as big as the World Trade Center. And uh, uh, my memory here, and what we, by the way, these kinds of memories, what we call them in psychology, they're flashbulb memories, okay? This is a, it's a concept in psychology that goes back uh, quite a ways. Um, let me get rid of my little flash guy here. Uh, these are called flashbulb memories. My flashbulb memory that morning is going in on the train in the morning underground. I believe it was underground. I must have been taking the red line uh, to downtown from where I lived. I must have switched from the brown line that's above to the red line that's below. And I remember seeing a bunch of folks on the train with cell phones, and you know, cell phones were very rare back then. And getting a signal in the tunnels in 2001 was like it was brand new. Uh, only one carrier had it. And uh, I remember seeing some folks on their phones with this concerned look on their faces. And I thought, what a coincidence, right? A bunch of people are getting bad news at the same time. As a psychology person, the idea of coincidence and illusory correlations and stuff like this is always something that's playing around inside my head. You know, just because these two things go together doesn't mean that there's some greater, you know, thing going on between them. It could just be randomness. So that's what I thought. I thought it was randomness. Get out of the train, go up to my, I was on the 18th floor at that time, sit down, and of course I'm always logged right into CNN or something, and that's when I realized, that's when I saw that a plane had hit uh, the, the first tower. And then a boss of mine walks by and tells me a second plane has just hit why don't you go home? And I remember thinking, you don't have to tell me twice because I'm in a skyscraper in downtown and we got the, you know, the tallest building in the United States is just down the street from me. Um, I don't want, you know, I, I don't want that to happen. And I, uh, we had always been a little bit worried, at least I had, there's a air and water show in Chicago every year where they're flying these fighter jets super fast, really pretty near the buildings, the downtown buildings. And I, I always, I, I just, Every year I get a little nervous, this is even before 9-11, that one of those things is going to go out of control, it's going to smash into some skyscraper. Um, so the idea of that happening was already sort of implanted in my head. Um, anyway, yeah, we call these flashbulb memories. And, um, you know, decades ago we theorized, psychologists theorized that these flashbulb memories are like video or picture imprints in the brain uh, and that they're super accurate, they're like a photograph. Later research, yeah, maybe not so much. It's really not all that accurate. It may feel extraordinarily accurate to us. Um, and these changes to these flashbulb memories occur quite often. Um, in fact, a team of psychologists and neuroscientists uh, got a hold of each other on the day of 9-11 uh, and said, we gotta do a study about this. We gotta do a memory study about this. We gotta see if these flashbulb memories stick you know, over, uh, over time. So they've done previous studies similar to this with the Challenger explosion, like what happened that time when you learned that the Challenger explosion, the space shuttle exploded. I remember that, I've got a flashbulb memory about that. My, I was in gym class in high school. My wrestling coach slash football coach slash health teacher uh, slash PE teacher uh, came over and said, do man, do man, the, the space shuttle just blew up. And I said, don't joke like that, that's not funny. Uh, and he said, no, it really did. And then the rest of the day we spent watching TV in, in, in high school. Um, so they did, they did some studies about that. So these researchers got together and decided, decided to do a, a memory study of 9-11. Uh, so they surveyed uh, New York City residents and around the country, okay, with a, a total sample size of 3,246 folks. Uh, and they did it a week. They got it set up and they were already out on the street in all these different cities around the U.S. asking people questions. Actually, the questions I just asked you about your experience were the questions that, in, in part, there are more than that, uh, the questions that they, they asked of the, these 3,246 people. Yeah. 
And so they did that at that, that, that one week later to try to get a baseline. This is what your memory is of the event one week after it happened, right? Not, probably not a lot of forgetting uh, going on during that period, but they wanted to see what would happen over time. Uh, so they went back to their sample of 3,246 folks, and they re-asked again at a year. That's uh, survey two. Two years later, survey three, and then 10 years later, survey four. Um, I don't know, what do you, so they asked some of those same kinds of questions. What they were interested in was not, uh, was, well, their criteria was, how close is your story at time two to time one? Are there any differences, right? They, we can't really know if the memory is a correct one, but we can tell if you've changed your story from time one to time two. So that's what they're interested in. Um, and what they found was that there was a rapid forgetting of both flashbulb memories and event memories uh, within that first year. Uh, after about the first year or so, the forgetting curve sort of leveled off a little bit, and I've got a graph that I'm going to show you. Um, and that really not significantly changing even after a 10-year delay, okay, despite that initial rapid forgetting. And what do I mean by rapid forgetting? Well, in this graph, we've got, okay, here's our, Time, there's time one, and then there's survey two at a, at a year, two years, and 10 years. Okay? And this is the proportion of consistency from statement, your one week statement, to later. Who did you talk to? What was the name of that person? Did you hear it on the TV or the radio or what? Oh, I heard it on the TV. Okay, well at time two, are you telling me you heard it on the TV? Um, and then some other, other things like, uh, how many planes were there involved? Um, what's the locate? Where was President Bush at when the time when when the when the uh, plane struck the towers? What were the names of the airlines? Okay, and these are all questions that were asked one at one week. Uh, how did you hear? What was the name of the person you told about it? What's the order of the events? What, what, you know that order of events that I showed you. And what they found was from time one to time two, the consistency, the, the being able, being able to stick to the story that you had at week one you're down to only 60%. One year later, a significant amount of your memory, the facts, the details, they've changed, they faded away. But, and then even it goes down even lower at three, and then there's this odd little thing that I'll explain in a minute that goes up here at, at four, just a, little, just a little bit there. But we're only about, you know, a little over 50% accurate or consistent in our memory that far later. Now, most folks, like it, even me, I'm telling you the story of, Oh yeah, you know, the folks on the, on, the, on the train and I heard about it from my, that boss and I may have some of those details wrong, right? I've shifted them around inside my head. I can't tell you to this day if I saw, I don't think I did. I, you know, I, I, I had a feeling that I saw the second tower hit, second plane hit the tower. But going back and thinking about when I heard about it, by the time I was able to get to a television, couldn't have happened. So what must have happened is that I reconstructed this memory based on my watching videos of it happening over and over and over again, and I've incorporated them into my story. Uh, and I'm not the only person that does this. All humans do it. It's the way human memory works. Some people get in trouble for it. Peter Jennings got in trouble for, I think it was Peter Jennings, or was it Brian Williams, uh, got in trouble for some story he was telling about uh, on the news, and then he sort of lost his job. But Joe, maybe you remember what that one is. I don't know. Do you, do you know? Okay. Hmm? Okay. Uh, uh, Hillary Clinton uh, telling a story about how she was under sniper fire in the Sarajevo airport or something. Turns out that wasn't true. Doesn't mean she's lying about it. It means that she's probably heard a couple of different stories that were very similar and over time your brain sort of blends them together and they become this new story that you're not lying about. You believe that it is true um, and you even feel that it's confident. Take a look at this. These are confidence ratings of people who are only recalling half of the information correctly, yet they're saying, I am still really confident in my ability to recall these things accurately. So one of the things that, I, that um, we, we know from memory research is that um, a person's confidence in their memory is not an indicator of its accuracy. Okay? Just because someone appears to be extraordinarily confident in what they know doesn't mean that they are, right? I think we raise a lot, we, we, we encourage confidence in some people and I think that's masking or it's masking a, a, a real uh, ambiguity there. Um, yeah, okay. 
So the overall consistency of the details of how they learned about 9-11 was only about 63% correct. So the consistency of the details about how they learned about 9-11, 63% correct. Uh, the third survey, three years after the attack, the consistency was 57%. Uh, so people were only a little more than 50% right for a lot of the details. Okay. Um, okay. So the, the interesting one is the where was President Bush when the attack happened? 87% okay. of people were accurate immediately after 9-11. They had heard that. Uh, but that dropped off to 57%. And then back up to 81% a little bit later. Can anybody, can anybody guess why? Uh, why might have, okay, right after 9-11, in the news, President Bush, what was President Bush doing? Does anybody remember? Joe. He was reading to a class of an elementary school or a third class in Florida. He was on a trip. Yeah, and okay. He got the message while he was there in front of the class. Yeah, yeah, he got the message in front of the, cl in front of the class. There he is, that's that image, right? Uh, the, like you can see the shock that he's, he, what he's hearing is his eyes are, you know, staring, thousand yard stare there. Um, yeah, so he was in Sarasota, Florida reading to some children and um, why, would, why might that detail, people know right before, right after the attack, uh, a year a or year two later, it's really down and then a little bit later it goes way back up. What might have, what, does anybody know what happened in the meantime that might have put that out into the collective consciousness? It wasn't an election. Hmm? I think that Laden was, was assassinated 10 years ago. I think this was like right after 10 years. Uh, this was, I think this was, uh, let me read this again. Okay. 87% uh, were accurate immediately after, but they dropped to 57% uh, a year later, and then back up. Uh, in that third one to 81% between the second and the third surveys. Uh, so what happened during that time was Michael Moore released his film uh, uh, Fahrenheit, uh, Fahrenheit 9 11. That was in the, and this, the, and this story featured pr pr uh, you know, uh, prominently in that, in that movie. So people's memories were getting jogged about it years later and then remembering after they had forgotten. Okay. Yeah. Okay, and then even President Bush uh, was prone to these kinds of memories. Uh, I was reading a, a CNN story about this, I didn't, uh, and uh, apparently on a number of occasions, uh, in speeches that he was that he's given, uh, President Bush talked about how he saw the first plane hit the hit the tower live on television, and then he, he knew the world changed at that time. So he had incorporated what he had seen and heard. I'm sure he's hearing a lot about it and seeing an awful lot of video of it and talking about it an awful lot. He incorporated that into his memory as something that he saw it live happen on television. And as far as we know, there were no television broadcasts of the World Trade Center at that time. Now, there is footage of the plane hitting. There's some, they're doing a, some, some public works survey or uh, videography thing, something for New York City. And, there was you know, a documentary filmmaker that was following the utility crew in, in New York City, and, and that they're the ones that happen to actually get the footage that we see later. Yeah, they, you hear the plane, and you know, I've been to New York a couple times, but I don't remember hearing loud planes flying right over Manhattan, uh, and it was low, and so they looked up and they pointed the camera up at it, and you see it just go slam right into the, into the building. And that footage got played uh, many, many, many times, and, and there are people you know, who will also claim they saw the first, per, first plane hit, or they saw the second plane hit, when according to the timeline of where they're at and what's going on, uh, that's impossible, right? They were nowhere near anything that would, could show them that's happening. So, um, so yeah, that's kinda, uh, kind, of, uh, kind of interesting here. So what about memory, right? We've kind of established a little bit that maybe memory is a bit failable, uh, even for really, really important things to really, really important people. Uh, who, who, you know, you would think they would have these really accurate memories about what's happening, even they're susceptible to it. Okay, we all are. Um, so let's have a little, have a little fun. Okay, let's have a little fun here. Uh, we're gonna do a little demonstration. And I want you to just listen. Uh, you can play along. You can play along two ways. Uh, you can play along by, I'm gonna read some words, and then I want you to write down the words that you remember on these sheets, or high tech, pull out your phone, open up something that you can quickly, tap the names of stuff into 
uh, and we're going to do a little memory test for you. Okay, so if you want, raise your hand if you want to. Got a couple of these, here you go. Or any sheet will really do. I just want to, I know not everyone's going to have a piece of paper, so. And I don't, don't have enough pen, pens for everybody. Oh, you got one? You got one? Okay. There you go. Okay. <clears throat> so I'm going to read some words. When I'm done with the words, I'll like look up and say okay or something. Uh, and then you can start writing down all the words you can remember. <clears throat> Drink water first. People at home can play along too. I think my wife and kids are watching on YouTube right now. They couldn't uh, couldn't couldn't make it to here. So uh, grab a pen and paper, Lou, Owen, Angela. Okay, you can take the test too here. Okay, here we go. Sour, honey, bitter. Heart, tooth, nice, sugar, chocolate, taste, tart, candy, soda, or pop, good, cake, and pie. Okay, write down as many words as you can. Remember, I'll give you a, a minute or so. <laughs> okay. When you're sort of done, you think you're all spent, you can sort of look up at me and I'll know that your your memory is exhausted. Some people are desperately, desperately trying to remember more and more. Can you tell me how many words there were? Uh, 15. I thought I had 18. No. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay, okay, we all done? We all think we got the list? Okay, so uh, you, you tell me if you, rec you recall these words. Sour. Okay, this is probably a good one. It's early on in the list. Another little memory thing, it's called the primacy effect. The first couple of things in a list we remember really, really well. The last couple of things we remember really, really well. The stuff in the middle, ooh, that gets uh, all jumbled around. Okay, so sour. Honey, okay. bitter, okay. heart, okay, those were the first ones, okay. Pie, that was the last one. Cake, okay. good, soda or pop. Okay, right, okay. Candy, got that one. Okay, chocolate, okay, got, got that one. Sweet, I never said the word sweet. I never said the word sweet. You do the same demo, we get it from the same book, yeah. So I never said the word sweet, yet a fair number of you, I didn't exactly count how many, remembered something that, was ne that never happened, okay? So what our brain does is it fills in details, all those things. That sounds like, it sounds pretty reasonable, right? Given what he just said, what I've done basically is I primed you. It's a psychological thing called priming where uh, given some stimuli, you're much more able to identify, recognize, remember, pay attention to very similar kinds of stimuli. And in this case, they're all words that have to do with sweet or related to sweet, sweet tooth, sour, honey, sweet, bitter, sweet. Sweet chocolate, sugar sweet, nice and sweet, candy sweet, soda sweet. So that's activated. That's like red hot inside your, your mind, but we never touched on it. Uh, and, and this is a, one simple way that you can demonstrate that our memories are very fallible, right? Uh, we remember things that did not happen. Okay. Again, your confidence in your, uh, your memory is not necessarily an indicator of how accurate you are. We had, uh, I did this recently in class, and when I said, how many remember sweet? I had a student like, shoot her hand up and she's like, I did. 
like she was super proud that she said that she remembered sweet, and I said, I never said sweet. And, oh, man, she was really, it really drove the point home, though, right? Like she was super confident that she heard the word sweet. Yeah, so there we go. Some takeaway points then, uh, right? Memory is fallible. Even vivid memories can include inaccuracies, even though we feel super confident about them and we can recall you know, the shirt that somebody was wearing and it might not be, right? Uh, Susan, uh, Elizabeth Loftus, Elizabeth Loftus, a, a memory researcher, has done some studies where she's even demonstrated how you can actually implant a vivid memory of an event that never happened to someone. It's called, it's called the Lost in the Mall Studies. Um, and she found, I think it was about a quarter or so of the folks that she did this little technique with uh, were able to come up with a pretty vivid memory and add in even more details to this thing that never happened to them of being lost in the mall, okay? Uh, right, so being confident in the memory is not a good indicator of a memory's consistency or its accuracy. So I always take super confident people uh, with a little bit of a grain of salt knowing this. Okay, so uh, yeah, Joe's point earlier, here's some, here's some footage that ha was from that morning. We're gonna talk about it and the implications of it and then this idea of what a schema is, okay? Uh, and I don't know why it's doing this thing with the one, we can still watch it. Mostly all this happened before cell phones were everywhere and certainly before phones had cameras on them where you're taking HD you know, video and you're live streaming it. So let's take a look, get this over here. So this is, this is, as far as I know, the first live broadcast of what was happening at the World Trade Center, CNN, okay? Yes, just local. Yes, yeah. So they cut into the commercial. This just in, you were looking at um, obviously a very disturbing live shot there. That is the World Trade Center, and we have unconfirmed reports this morning. That 8.49 a.m. Of the World Trade Center. CNN Center right now is just beginning to work on this story, obviously calling our sources and trying to figure out exactly what happened, but clearly something relatively devastating happening this morning there on the south end of the island of Manhattan. That is, once again, a picture of one of the towers of the World Trade Center. Well, you can see these pictures, it's obviously uh, something devastating has happened and again unconfirmed reports that a plane has crashed into one of the towers there we are covering more information on this subject as it becomes available to you right now we've got sean murton he is a cnn producer on the telephone right now sean what can you tell us about what you know this is uh, sean murton just was uh, standing on the uh, uh, vice president of finance Sean, Vice President of Finance for CNN. Sean, we're on the air right now. What, what can you tell us about the situation? Hello? Yes, Sean, you're on the air right now. Uh, can, well, can, go ahead. What can you tell us? I, I just witnessed a plane that appeared to be cruising uh, slightly lower than normal at altitude over New York City, and it appeared to have crashed into, uh, I don't know which tower it is, but it hit directly in the middle of uh, one of the World Trade Center towers. Sean, what kind of plane? Was it a small plane, a, a it jet? A, uh, it was a jet. Uh, it looked like a two-engine jet, um, maybe a 737. You're talking about a large passenger commercial large jet. large passenger commercial jet. And where were you when you saw this? I am on the 21st floor of 510 Plaza. Did it appear that the plane was having any difficulty flying? Yes, it did. It, it was teetering uh, back and forth, wingtip to wingtip. Okay, so I'm not going to play the whole thing here. Uh, but it's interesting, no one has yet said the word terrorism, right? Um, and my initial, when I first learned about this too, and I'm, I'm recalling now, maybe it's an accurate recall, I don't know, uh, thinking, wow, the pilot must have been sick, or there must have been some real malfunction in the way that the, the controls were for it to hit like that. What a horrible thing to have happened, that's such a big mistake. And the idea that someone would do this on purpose did not occur to me at all. Okay, that, that changes very shortly. Michael Jordan Oops. has finally given some stuff. Oh, yeah. So this is. Uh, For the first time, he has. Hmm? You gotta start with Jordan. Yeah. Uh, so this is the news, right? 2001, Michael Jordan may be returning to basketball. Remember then? Uh, so here, here it is. Okay, this is the one I wanna show you here. This is a, another. Is with us right now, Miss Renault. Good morning. Good morning. How this are is, you? This is Brian Dumble. I'm down on uh, 59th and 5th. Where are you? I am in Chelsea, and we are uh, at 8th and 16th. 
clear the tallest building in the area, and we my window faces south, uh, so it looks directly onto the World Trade Center. And I would say, you know, approximately 10 minutes ago, there was a major explosion from probably, it looks like about the 80th floor, it looks like it's affected probably four to eight floors. Uh, major flames are coming out of the, let's see, the north side and also the east side of the building, yes. And it was a very loud explosion followed by flames that looks like the building is still on fire on the inside. Um, which building are we talking about? The one that's westernmost? Um, let's see, yes sir. So it's coming out on the north side, the east side of the building, the west and right top. That's correct. Um, you're, you're over in Chelsea. Um, did you hear the explosion oh, yes. in your position? Yes, we did. As a matter of fact, we, we heard it and because and, I was just like standing there pretty much looking out the window. I didn't see what caused it or if there was an impact. Oh, right down there. So you have no idea where it ran. Oh, that's another one. Another okay. plane. It was down there. Right. Oh, my God. Another plane has just hit. Oh my God, it's right in the middle of the building. This one is to the east top. Yes, yes, right in the middle of the building. It, and right now, that, yes, that was definitely what like, it was on purpose. You saw a yes, plane? Yes, I just saw a plane go into the building. Why do you say that was definitely on purpose? It's because it just it just flew straight into it. There's not it didn't look like it was uh and it didn't look like a commercial jet. It was a smaller plane. It was definitely a smaller plane. Okay, so that's interesting there. There are two things that sort of struck me with this conversation. Uh on uh, was this is this Good Morning America or what is this with Brian Gumble? Uh Brian Gumble saying to her, Why do you why do you think it was on purpose? Right? Now it, oh, what uh, Nowadays, no one would even question if it was on purpose if something like that happened, right? We, we have a very different schema uh, of what plane crashes are today and what events like this uh, entail. Uh, and then the woman said, it was definitely a smaller plane, okay? It wasn't, both were Boeing 767s. It was flying a lot faster, but it wasn't. So even with like live detail, seeing it live, already we've got, you know, quote unquote misinformation uh, getting out there and you know, so even a, an eyewitness testimony here, she saw it happen, claimed it was a smaller plane, okay? And it wasn't a smaller plane. So I think when you start to get some of these conspiracy theorists, uh, grab a hold of some of these inconsistencies in people, uh, in people's reports and tellings of it, and that, uh, that explodes into, well, the stuff that we're still going on today. Okay. So our schemas have changed, our schema uh, is a stereotype for a situation. It's a stereotype for, the, for events that happen in our lives. Um, you know, we have them for many different experiences. You have a schema for eating at a fancy restaurant, and that schema is different than eating at a fast food restaurant. The schema for fancy restaurant is, okay, what, what happens in this situation? It's sort of typical and normal. I go in, somebody sit, seats, me, seats me there, gives me the menus, someone comes back later, asks for, the, asks for what I want to eat, I pay at the table, someone brings me the food, I'm not expected to bust my own table. Very different, right? If you go into McDonald's and you expect someone to seat you, right, and then uh, uh, you leave your stuff on your table, mm, you know, you're not doing it the way that you're, I guess you're supposed to be doing it. So uh, yeah, we have these schemas and today, or that day, up until then, uh, plane cr crashing, even into buildings, it was not automatically thought of as a terrorist attack, but not today. Okay, so people's schemas of what was possible in the world, especially in the United States, changed. Okay, changed because of this. Our view on the world changed because of those moments. Okay, so talking about this fear, this in, in new, new fear of terrorism. This is a Gallup poll. Gallup's been asking this particular question. Uh, how worried are you that you or someone in your family will become a victim of terrorism? Very worried, somewhat worried, not too worried, or not worried at all. And the green line here over the course of, um, this is about 95 to, to now, uh, the green line is the people that report, the answer very or somewhat worried, okay? So the sort of the top two uh, categories here, not the bottom two categories. And we see here, uh, you know, it's been up and down. You know, this obviously, this is, this is uh, right after 
um, two, uh, after 9-11, right? There's this big spike in fear of terrorism here. Um, it's quite a bit lower. You know, look at that, year 2000, it's as low as it has ever been on this timeline, right? So we were really, really, um, we were really, really uh, uh, not, not very afraid. What about right here? Does anybody remember what happened around 95 or so that might have caused people to feel pretty bad about the terrorist Melissa? Wasn't there another bombing? There was a really big one up until that point. It was the biggest one. It was Oklahoma City bombing. Yeah, Timothy McVeigh um, and Terry Nichols killed 168 people on that day. Okay, and then the year later was the Centennial Olympic Park bombing right, where that nail bomb exploded in the crowd of people. So we were pretty on edge after those two terrorist attacks in back-to-back -back years. Nothing had happened in the intervening years. We went down, boosted up here to 58. Uh, right in here, 2015, we see another boost tip here to 51, right? Uh, the highest it had been since uh, 2001. What about that bomb? What about uh, what happened there? You remember what happened back in, uh, in 2015, 2016? ISIS. Hmm? ISIS. Here in the United States. This one's here in the United States. That's Boston Marathon? No, it wasn't Boston, wasn't Boston Marathon. That's a good guess. This one is the, uh, the San Bernardino attack uh, in the Inland Regional Center in San Bernardino where they went in with the M M4s or whatever and they shot off a bunch of their co-workers, right? Uh, 14 people were killed. Uh, and then in 2016, that was the Orlando uh, nightclub shooting, right? The Pulse nightclub shooting, 49. 49 people were killed and 53 people were injured in a terrorist attack at that, at that nightclub. So I'm guessing that's where that, we got that boost there. But looking at this graph and sort of the changes over time, I'm sort of wondering like, why given everything that's going on right now, uh, why are we so seem to be sort of low, right? We're at one of the lowest points since right around in here. And I'm guessing all these spikes were the, you know, red alert, yellow alert, we're on yellow, we're on, we're on green, we're on red, we're on, and that's the, the, all that changing there as, as the government would uh, put out those kinds of alerts. Okay, so we have this fear, this fear of, fear of terrorism, this uh, new, new schema for stuff in the world, events in the world, and as a result, uh, there are some false alarms. Maybe you remember some of these false alarms, false alarms of terrorist attacks, because people are on high alert. See something, say something. I think it's probably something we've, we've all heard that, right? Here's one. Uh, this is from September, I think it's 14th, uh, 2002, okay? Um, and this is the front, the cover of the page of the New York Times. Here it is, here's the article here, a false alarm in Florida. But right next to it, look what everything else is happening here in, uh, uh, on, the, on, the, on, the, on the front page. Uh, U.S. task in the Afghan desert, the hunt to Taliban. U.S. says suspect tied to 9-11 and Al-Qaeda is captured. Uh, Bush is doubtful Iraq will comply with U.N. demands. Uh, it's all about, we're, it's all about fear of some really bad stuff that might be coming along, okay? This turned out to be probably some smart aleck uh, uh, guys of Middle Eastern descent messing with some, some lady at a diner. So they started talking about blowing something up to make her, make her nervous and she called the cops on them and they got pulled over and they got searched and nothing came of it, okay? Here's another one, a professor suspected of being a terrorist because he was writing a differential equation. He's on a plane sitting next to someone, working on his math, writing a differential equation, and he is from, he's from uh, Italy, I think. His name's Guido, Guido Menzio, uh, and he's uh, olive-skinned, curly, dark-haired, native Italian, okay? And so he's darker-skinned. And because he's writing in this thing that she can't understand, she thought it was Arabic or some secret code, and the plane gets delayed because she thought he was a terrorist. Okay. Uh, here's another one. Heightened, sense, heightened terror concern leads to the spate of uh, false alarms. Some kid on a bus had a clock. He was nervous. He dropped the clock on the bus floor, and they called in the canine units. Okay. Um, like you can't hold a clock, you can't drop a clock without someone see seeing that as potentially a time bomb, right? And then this one here, uh, turnpike terror plot might be false alarm. Again, this was uh, some uh, Spanish citizens uh, with work visas here that were taking pictures of parts of the, the toll roads in Pennsylvania. Uh, and uh, in, in some area where you, you can only get access to if you have permission or keys. 
uh, and they were there and they were caught and they're taking photos of these facilities over a number of different days and uh, the executive officer here is saying we're treating this as a possible terrorist activity. Uh, turns out the Turnpike had put out like requests for proposals for you know, improving or buying the Turnpike and these were guys, investors that were there taking pictures to take back to the boss to see if they wanted to invest in this, uh, in this thing and they got arrested, okay? Again, they're from Spain so I can only sort of assume that they might have dark hair and a little bit darker skin, right? Um, yeah, so we have all these false alarms. So um, our level of fear and distrust um, and the way that we interpret ambiguity Right? We use those schemas to help make sense of ambiguous situations. Uh, so how we interpret ambiguity in the world changed. We began to see possibilities of a terrorist attack in more places, especially about foreigners. Yeah, now, someone gave a talk a couple of years back here about our fear of immigrants. I, I heard it was a pretty good talk. You know, maybe, maybe you saw it. Okay, so now the bad news bias. The bad news bias, a little bit more uh, about uh, the way the human mind works. I, I got into a little bit of this in that fear of immigrants talk. Uh, we human beings have a bias to pay attention to bad news. Ba we like, we don't, I don't know if we say we like bad news, but we can't help but pay attention to bad news. We slow down when we drive past the car crash, right? There are all those YouTube channels of people like popping cysts and things, right? We, like, we, ooh, we can't help it ourselves, but like watch that stuff. Okay, um, so this researcher, uh, John Cassiope, who was a, sort of founded the area of uh, 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 social neuroscience, uh, wanted to see if he could determine or could, could demonstrate this bad news bias that exists within our own minds uh, by, uh, by, uh, by measuring the oh, uh, electrical activity, the event-related brain potentials or electrical activity on the cortex of people as they, experience, as they saw different things. So, He'd already figured out that there are certain images that people don't like, some that are neutral and some that they like, okay? Things that people don't like to see. They don't like to see mutilated cats or mutilated human faces. I'm not gonna show you either of those right now, right? I think we've seen enough horror uh, this, after, this evening here. So we've got a, here's our stand in for the uh, mutilated cat, right? <laughs> things that we like, right? He's found things like Ferraris, pizza, Right? These are things that people tend to have a positive reaction to, right? unless you're gluten intolerant and then it's not gonna work out so well for you. Um, uh, and then things that are sort of neutral, like a hairdryer. Okay? And so he measured this uh, action potential on the cortex of people as they were, as they were presented with these images. And he found that, um, he found that the, the human brain reacts a heck of a lot more too. There's a lot more activity going on. There's a lot more processing going on uh, when we see the negative images. Split second into the negative image, bam, uh, you're seeing a lot more electrical activity than you are in either of these other two. So, you know, not only do we have sort of this like psychological evidence in terms of surveys and experiments and things, but we can demonstrate it on a biological level as well. Um, yeah. Okay. So the bad, we have this bad news bias that exists within us. So yeah, the bias is within us, right? That we pay attention to negative stimuli more than the positive. Right. Oh. All right, good, why is life so unfair? We pay attention to the bad. I think this is a cartoon of faculty when they are given their idea course evaluations, <laughs> right? Uh, and we pay attention to the bad stuff that somebody writes uh, there might be a bunch of folks in there saying, best professor ever. And that one person says, he was really slow at returning our homework. And we're like, oh, no. you know, and that really gets to us. We pay more attention to the bad stuff, okay? And well, we, people know this and people make money off of this fact, right? There's a, in, in uh, communication journalism, uh, the news world, uh, the tabloid news world, uh, if it bleeds, it leads. Here's a, a very recent study uh, just published earlier this year, March of 2021, an economics professor at Dartmouth had noticed something a little bit strange about the COVID television coverage. He said, despite the fact that what he was hearing from the scientific journals and his science friends about, you know, the, the rates of COVID infection, it was doom and gloom on the, on the news. And so what he did is he, he went through and 
did a, uh, a word analysis, right, look, looking at the words as being positive, negative, or neutral words, uh, through all these different news stories and found this. Here's the percent of you know, negative coverage in the U.S. national news, the international news, and the U.S. local and regional news, which maps much, much more like the international news. Uh, why might this be? Well, you know, you, fear drives people to you know, want to find out more. Um, maybe by watching the news, they feel like they have a sense of control over the situation, uh, so they keep watching. And what he was saying is that you know, even as COVID rates were declining across most of the country, there were spots where there were hot spots, right? And when the coverage was declining across the country, the coverage of the hot spots went up. The, the, cover, the coverage wasn't most of the United States is in a decline for COVID. It was, while that's true, we've also got these hot spots. Let's go to the hot spots. Let's talk to the people at the hot spots. What's going on at the hot spots? So there's always this negative coverage. Okay? And I think that kind of dovetails nicely with, uh, you know, the, the, uh, the, the revelation that uh, Facebook weighted more heavily in its, in its algorithm of what to show you, things that people that you knew uh, had put the angry emoji on are five times more likely to show up in your feed than the happy one, right? This is sort of the people are angry, they're mad, they're upset, they're fearful, uh, they don't like that thing, and that drives views, right? We, we gravitate towards that bad news. I don't think we like it. I think we dislike it in a way, but I feel like we, we, it's almost like an addiction to it. It's not good for us, but we do it anyway. Okay. So if it bleeds, it leads, but where to? Where does it lead to? Uh, I would say there's a fair amount of anxiety, rumination, perseveration, uh, fear, and leading up to maybe some collective trauma that's happened. Okay, right? What is trauma? I, I, my, my whole my thing was about memory, fear, and trauma. So now we're talking about, about trauma. Uh, uh, collective trauma is a, some cataclysmic event that shatters the basic fabric of society. And I think 9-11 qualifies as a trauma, traumatic event in the United States. I'd say also COVID uh, and the, our response to COVID and the political divisions that, have, are, that are a result of it um, are also a you know, cataclysmic event. Um, yeah, so while the nation experienced trauma during 9-11, uh, yeah, so while the nation experienced trauma during 9-11, when the idea that we are safe was dismantled, right? Those, those in New York City experienced it the most, um, right? A lot of trauma. There's lots of studies about what happened in New York City. Uh, friends of mine worked on a study uh, where they looked at the first responders to 9-11 to and the air, people that lived in the area and the rates of cancer and all that. And I think there's like $10 billion in payouts that they're making to people uh, for that, right? There's the first responders fund. So what is trauma here? Some external event. Trauma is an external event. Tra trauma is not something that's inherent within a person. It's an external event. That's, I think, a really important distinction to make. Um, I think previous to about 1980, the American Psychological Association said trauma is more of sort of a anxiety disorder within a person. It's the person was disordered, and that's why they that's why they're experiencing this. After that, they said, "Wait a minute, no, it's something external to the person that triggers this thing, and it's a little bit random as to who it happens to. We don't know." Um, Simple media exposure to a 9-11 video is not a traumatic event, okay? Uh, if you're at 9-11 and you see people jumping from the World Trade Center, that is a traumatic event. Seeing videos of it being removed like that so far from it, while it's an unpleasant thing, doesn't quite qualify as a trauma, okay? However, I'd say that the consequences of what 9-11 meant, we are no longer safe, and we're distrusting all sorts of people, we're afraid, we think it's gonna happen again, there are people encouraging us to sort of think that it's going to happen again. Uh, that was a traumatic event that occurred, okay? Um, and for most folks, when they experience a trauma, it's in, in emo some emotional response, uh, unpredictable emotions, some flashbacks, strained relationships, physical symptoms, headaches, nausea. For most folks, it's usually temporary. Okay? When it's not temporary, uh, that's, when we supposed, that's when we start saying that's going to be PTSD. Okay? Most people don't develop PTSD. Not to say that you can experience a trauma and then everything's roses for you. 
it just doesn't rise to some clinical level of, uh, of a, of a diagnosed, diagnosed case of PTSD, right? There are subclinical sorts of experiences people have. Okay, so I wanna make the point here that PTSD is not a post-traumatic stress disorder, is not a fear-based anxiety disorder, is not something that's an, is some weakness in us uh, or some illness that's within us. It's a, a, a normal human response to uh, extraordinarily tragic event, warfare, seeing someone die, being in a horrible car accident and believing that you're gonna die, right? Those are all things that uh, can be traumatic events. Sexual assault, right? Certainly a traumatic event, okay? Okay, quickly a little bit, we wrap up here. I know I'm at about uh, our seven o'clock hour. PTSD, estimates hmm. in the general population about 68% of people will experience it uh, in a lifetime. Uh, and what does that mean to experience it? It means experiencing some intrusive sorts of uh, thoughts and memories of the traumatic event, reoccurring, involuntary, upsetting memories that pop into your head uncontrollably, you can't help it, okay? Repeated upsetting dreams. You go to sleep and you have the same dream over and over again. Um, used to live not near, uh, when we first moved here, we lived next to a Vietnam veteran. Uh, and he had frequently had recurring dreams in 2013, 14, recurring dreams from Vietnam that was still, still haunting him. Strong body relaxations, and increased heart rates when you're reminded of the event. You avoid people, places, conversations, objects, or situations that are related to that thing. Um, you know, if you're a, a, a veteran who experienced PTSD because of a, a roadside bomb, driving down, First Avenue and seeing a little pile of garbage with something that looks like a string coming out of it can be extraordinarily triggering because that's gonna remind you of the kinds of stuff that you're looking for as you're driving through Iraq or Afghanistan uh, that might be a bomb, okay? Negative, uh, yeah, uh, avoiding things. Negative changes in thoughts and mood. People with PTSD may experience a pervasive negative emotional state, shame, anger, fear, pervasive emotional state. Um, Persistent negative evaluations of themselves and their worth. They're unlovable, the world's an evil place. All right, imagine thinking that all the time. Uh, blaming themselves, losing interest in things that normally make you happy. Uh, and then finally, uh, reactivity, high levels of reactivity. You're always on guard, you're jumping around. This is why you know, folks say around 4th of July, be careful about who your neighbors are and you're blowing off uh, fireworks because that's gonna be triggering to folks with PTSD if they're involved in some sort of you know, warfare activity that caused the PTSD. Heightened startle response and irritability and problem sleeping. Okay, so as we wrap up a little bit here, I'll leave you with this. Some psychologists and people who study trauma suggest that in addition to the New York City residents who experienced tra a very traumatic event on 9-11, uh, and the rest of the country also experienced a very traumatic event as the sort of the repercussions of, of what that meant to be attacked, okay, that our invasion of Iraq in 2003 created a second trauma to the U.S., created a second trauma to the U.S. Why do they say that? Uh, a few studies here. A study of 60,000 Iraq and Afghanistan vets determined that about 13.5% suffered from PTSD. 68% in the normal population, 13.5% in this particular study of 60,000 Iraq uh, vets. Um, they were co commissioned and, and not. So folks that were on the front lines and then folks that were you know, in Germany sending supplies around. Uh, two other studies, one from the RAND Corporation and one from the Veterans Administration, puts the estimate higher. 20 to 30% suffer from PTSD. And I've seen estimates that go back to previous wars. Vietnam, Korea, World War II, and the studies are, it's pretty consistent. It's around 20%, 20 to 30% of folks who go off to war uh, and fight wind up with PTSD. So I end here uh, with the question of whether some wars are worth it, given the inevitable damage that will do to our military's mental well-being and how the PTSD that they will suffer from, we know that's gonna happen. It's, we don't know who, but 20 to 30% of them uh, will, uh, they'll suffer from PTSD uh, and, the, and that PTSD will unavoidably ripple throughout their families and their communities. Domestic abuse, alcoholism, drug abuse, 
Um, not a pleasant sight. So all, we all pay the price for the folks who are suffering from PTSD. You know, do, do we do a good job of taking those PTSD rates into account when we go off to war? Is that something that's part of the calculation from the folks in the administration saying, okay, if we go to war, you gotta know one third, almost one third of these folks, these fine people uh, that are serving our country, they're gonna come back, they're gonna be severely damaged mentally. That doesn't count the folks who lose arms and legs and things like that, right? How much of that are we willing to spend? How much of the, someone else's mental health are we willing to spend? Um, you know, do we actually consider that harm worth it? And that's kind of the question that I wanna end, end with here. Um, so that's sort of the, uh, yeah, sort of heavy topic. Um, are there questions? Any questions for me? Yes, Joe, uh, yeah. Maybe, uh, oh, so to go back to the, the fear of terrorism in Iran, uh, did it go down in 2021? Is that because of COVID or is it coming out? Yeah, so I, that's, I was curious about that too. Uh, why? Why are, why are we here? Why are we so low right here? Yeah, uh, I, we're distracted with other things, I think. Uh, maybe it's this COVID, right? That's the thing that's a availability heuristic. Uh, what's the thing that's a threat to you? It's COVID, right? That's the thing that we pops into our mind first right now. Or civil war, right? Uh, um, uh, yeah, who knows? You know, there's a lot of other things that people I think feel are more immediate threats, more tangible threats maybe. Uh, and, and once those go away, uh, we'll, we'll be scared of terrorism again, I think. Yeah. Good question. Yeah. Joe. With the memory survey study, what was the response rate for the following, you know, survey two, three, and four? That's very good. It's about 50%, which is about as good as you can get when you do those kinds of surveys uh, over that, that amount of time unless you're willing to spend millions and millions of dollars. Because I, I used to work on those kinds of surveys and you know, they told us you need to get at least a 90% respo uh, uh, response rate over the waves. You need to keep this many people. So over the course of 20 years, we might have still 80% of the people that we had at year one, 20 years later, still responding. But those things cost millions of dollars each time you do them. Uh, and most, uh, most academics uh, don't have easy access to that kind of cash to do a survey. But I feel pretty comfortable. I mean, if you got, you would think that the folks that thought they would do a really bad job wouldn't show up, right? Uh, and still, the people did a really bad job, right? So maybe these are the best of the best. Um, and it's actually worse. But good question. Mm -hmm. So I was here a couple of weeks ago and we were asked again to share our memories of 9-11. Okay. Uh, I was with my wife and I spoke up and said, here's what I was doing 9-11. On the way home, my wife said, I'm so glad you spoke up, but just so you know, you were wrong about most everything. <laughs> <laughs> no way. Yeah. So it's true. You know, I, you know I, I think she was half wrong and I was half wrong. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but we did, we collaborated and we sort of realized, yeah, I guess we were both remembering it differently. So I, I was fascinated by this. Okay, good. Melissa. Yeah, fascinated as well. Um, and I'm trying to like wrap my brain around, I'm a social worker, but I love studying psychology. <laughs> but wrapping my brain around these flash, flash bulb, call them? Flash, flash bulb, bulb. Flash bulb uh, moments, and thinking about how our brain, because it is such a heightened sense of awareness, and we pay attention to these negative things because they're threats. And so I'm wondering, like, is your mind reorganizing this into fragments? And then we lose the linear, like, yeah. time frame? Yeah, it's frequent. Why? Maybe Jacqueline knows more about this than I do because okay. she's the cognitive psychologist. But, yes. and feel free to chime in. But even, on? so one of the things, one of the criticisms of women who suffer from sexual assault is when they retell their story, it's in bits and pieces that are not in linear order. Yeah. And, and that, is, that is the case. This is what happens when you're a highly emotionally charged event. You will not forget that the thing happened, but all the details that go along with it that you know, the police may be using to investigate it, we didn't evolve to, to, to carry all those little pieces of information along with us, right? right. Uh, there was you know, 200,000, 300,000 years ago, there weren't cavemen police uh, investigating caveman crimes. 
So we didn't need to remember that stuff. And really emotionally charged events. I remember being mugged at gunpoint, or perhaps gunpoint, it was a little un unclear, uh, in the foyer of my, the bu into the building that I lived in in Chicago. And immediately after we were done, as I'm with the police, I'm like, I don't think I could really, if he showed me the kid, I don't think I could, t t could pick him out of a lineup. Even though I was staring right at him, I was paying attention to the gun. Uh, I wasn't paying attention to, to his face. So yeah, details get mixed up. We important things or things you would think are important, people don't know. Yeah, yeah. Joe. So what you're saying is that any student that says that my exam is a traumatic event, yeah. they're not real. They're being a little sarcastic and over exaggerated. Absolutely, you can tell them Dr. Dew said they're wrong. All right, I mean, yeah. that's you're wrong. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Other questions? Okay, well I wanted to leave us with, Matt, did you have, I saw your hand start jump, okay. Uh, so I wanted to leave us with something that was a little bit uh, nicer. You know, I asked you to remember uh, the events of, of September 11th. So instead of the events of September um, 11th, what I'd, what I'd really like you to do is to remember the 21st of September. <laughs> leave us on a little, maybe a little positive note here. Has finally made it appear. Okay. All right, all right. Get, get some of the negative stuff away. Okay, so I planted an earworm now. Thank you everybody for coming. I appreciate it. Thank you very much.